Welcome to this episode of Consider It Blacklit. I am Kim, your host, and for those of you tuning in for the first time, Consider It Blacklit highlights films, television programs, and stage plays that feature African Americans both in front of the camera and behind the scenes. We also discuss social issues as it relates to some of these programs and how they may or may not impact our communities. So thank you for tuning in and we hope you continue to tune in each week. Today we will highlight the documentary, Matthew Kennedy, One Man's Journey. It is about the life of Matthew Kennedy, an accomplished musician at a young age who eventually directed the Fisk University Jubilee Singers. Let's take a look at some highlights. I was born in America's Georgia, March 10th, 1921. My mother was Mary Dowdell Kennedy, my father, Royal Clement Kennedy. My father had attended a Sunday school convention in Washington, D.C. and. Uh, that was a, that little period of separation when he was away from home. And uh, my mother feels that when he came back, that there was a bit of passion in their getting together again. And she thinks that that might have been the moment of my conception. My father loved the music. The music that he heard at that meeting so inspired him that he thought he would like uh, my name to incorporate Washington. He thought in observing me at the table at mealtime that I would just run my fingers along the table as if I were playing the piano. And he said to my mother on one occasion that I think something special is in the baby and I think it's music. Whatever it is, you develop it. He had a feeling that he was not going to live much longer uh, after I had been born. And he died when I was just about 16 months old. I don't remember my father. Today we have joining us to discuss the film, the filmmaker of the documentary, and the daughter of Matthew Kennedy, Nina Kennedy. Welcome, Nina. Thank you, Kim. Thanks for having me. So what inspired you to do this documentary about your father? Well, it was really born of necessity. Um, my mother had died in uh, 2001, 
And um, this was the first time I walked into my parents' home after her funeral. Uh, they had moved into a retirement community. And obviously, they hadn't fully unpacked from the previous residence, the move. So the boxes were just piled from floor to ceiling um, in all the rooms. And there were some rooms you just couldn't even walk into. The, the cars couldn't fit in the garage because it was full of boxes. So um, I decided to spend the rest of that week just trying to make some sense out of uh, my father's living space. And after a couple of days going through boxes and papers and documents, and I started realizing I have material here for a documentary. I found uh, photographs and, and recordings, uh, real recordings, radio broadcasts, uh, recordings of live concerts, articles from all mm -hmm. over the world. I mean, there really was tremendous material for a documentary film. Mm -hmm. So that's really what got it started. Wow. And he's had a fascinating life. So tell us, um, when he started playing music, did he play by ear? Did he take lessons? How did he start? Um, at first, he would hear his, uh, his mother singing mm -hmm. hymns from church, and he would go to the piano that they had in their little house and just start to pick out the melodies. Now, how the old was he at the time? Uh, I suppose three or four, wow. just just old enough to be able to reach up to touch the keyboard. Wow! And um, my my mother or my my grandmother decided right then to start giving him some some lessons. His, or his his sister was already taking piano lessons, mm -hmm. so she asked her daughter to uh, to help him develop. And it got to the point where he was su surpassing her wow. in her ability. So mm -hmm. they they searched around for a teacher who mm -hmm. would be able to guide him. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And um, I was looking at the film, and eventually this white woman agreed to teach him. Right. Tell us about her. Right. Well, this lady, uh, her name was Kate Land. Um, she had some qualms about the neighbors seeing a black family coming in and out of her house, mm -hmm. so she had them come in uh, the back way, and uh, there were times when, um, when she would have recitals for all of her students. Uh, my father and his mother weren't allowed to sit with the other students and their families. Uh, they would have to sit in the back, and uh, she would uh, announce at the end that Sunshine was going to come out and, and entertain them. Now, Sunshine, my father was given the name Sunshine um, at the cinema where he played the organ for the silent films. Mm. Remember, films were silent back in the 1920s, and uh, he accompanied them, you know, just improvising mm -hmm, if it mm -hmm. was a chase scene or a love scene mm -hmm, or whatever. Mm -hmm. And um, he already had a reputation. He was known as Sunshine. They mm -hmm. dressed him up as a bellhop. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Entertain. We don't know people. how we feel about that, but okay, we're going to roll with it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He, he was able to go to the movies for free, so mm -hmm, he was happy mm -hmm, about mm -hmm, it and mm -hmm. uh, bring his mama some money. So, um, and then soon he had a, a radio show mm, at okay. Sunshine. Okay. So when uh, when he would come out, you know, the, the piano teacher kind of made it seem like um, it was a big surprise mm -hmm, mm -hmm. for him to come out. Mm. But I'm sure the issue was the other families just didn't want them seated in the same area. Wow, wow. Which is very sad. Did your father ever talk about, um, and I know he touched on this in the film, mm -hmm. how he felt about segregation at the time? Yeah, he's a little disconnected from his feelings, mm -hmm. <laughs> one mm -hmm. could say, that's to put it mildly. Mm -hmm. um, he would try to justify uh, so, some of the things he, he endured. You know, he, he was always playing down what happened. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm sure, since he did grow up with an older brother, I'm sure his brother was a lot more vocal. Mm -hmm, about mm -hmm. what was going on. Mm -hmm. And uh, their mother, I'm sure, was just living in terror of something happening mm -hmm, to, mm -hmm. to them. I mean, in the early 1920s, that was when the Klan was at its peak mm -hmm, in, mm -hmm. uh, in rural Georgia. Mm -hmm. And uh, for this single, single mother having to keep her boys in line just to keep them alive, mm -hmm. I'm sure it was a real indoctrination right, and just right, not, right. not expressing anger or even mm -hmm. feeling it. Mm -hmm. initially. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, it was difficult for him. I mean, for him, 
he, he was a dark-skinned man. And for me, by comparison, he just assumed that I, I wouldn't have any of these problems. Mm -hmm. So he just didn't want to bring it up with me mm -hmm. at all. Mm -hmm. And you can see in the film, I'm really digging, you know, mm -hmm. trying mm -hmm. to get him to talk about his feelings mm -hmm. and, and how it felt to, to have to sit in a segregated place or not mm -hmm. to be able to drink from a fountain or, or use the bathroom or these mm -hmm. things. And he just, he just, you know, brushes it off. I wonder if it was, uh, that was uh, something of black men in that era because mm -hmm. my father never talked about the bad things of segregation. He never wanted to share those, those things with me. Mm -hmm. And I guess as his daughter, he didn't want to pass it along. And right. a lot of things I didn't find out about him until he passed away and people talked about it at his funeral. Mm. But he wouldn't share it. So I'm wondering if, you know, black men of that era, that was their way of trying to protect us. That you know, be, so yeah. they didn't talk about it. That's just me throwing in my little psychological analysis <laughs> of it. <laughs> um, so let's get back to your father. He actually, um, he played on the radio, but um, he did some other things too. There was the theater, he played on the radio. Tell us about his radio show. Well, he was known as Sunshine mm -hmm. when he uh, performed on the radio and uh, people throughout that area of Georgia knew his name and knew his program. Mm -hmm. um, this was um, in the 19, uh, late 1920s, mm -hmm. and uh, it was around this time that um, the famous Russian pianist Sergei Rachmaninoff mm -hmm. came through town, um, and that he was able to, to be a living witness to a live performance by mm -hmm. Rachmaninoff. I and mean, when, when we did the film, when we shot it, uh, there aren't many people alive who can say that, that they actually heard Rachmaninoff live. Wow. And um, that concert in Macon, Georgia, affected him so much that he set out to imitate Rachmaninoff's playing style. Hmm. And that was eventually what uh, won him a scholarship here in New York at Juilliard, yeah. since he went into the audition and uh, imitated. <laughs> and you, it, those who know Rachmaninoff's music, his uh, his interpretations can be a little extreme. Mm -hmm, you know, he'll mm -hmm. speed up or slow down or mm -hmm. make it extremely soft or extreme, like mm -hmm. extreme for the live audience. Right, right. And none of that is, is really documented in the score. Mm. But he just, uh, he imitated this, this style of playing. Wow. And one of the jurors at uh, Juilliard was so impressed that she offered to take him on as a student uh, offered to give him a scholarship mm -hmm. and went to the administration to ask if they would provide, you know, for the rest of his uh, his studies. Yeah. And, uh, now, did he when he came to New York the first time, did he specifically come to audition for Juilliard or? To audition, right. Yeah, through this, uh, the his teacher. mom brought him up. Yeah, right, yeah. Right. And from what I understand from the film, initially he didn't win the first set of scholarships, but this woman came in to be his sponsor. Right. Yeah, tell us about her, what was her name? Lois Adler. Mm -hmm. uh, she, uh, her family, the Adler family, uh, were responsible for the Adler Planetarium in Chicago. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. yeah. So she, they had bank. <laughs> th there you go, there you go. And she wanted to take him on mm -hmm. as a student. Mm -hmm. And uh, some of her family members were still here in New York. I got to meet some of them when I came mm -hmm. to study at Juilliard. Oh, wow. Oh, yeah. wow, that's fantastic. So he was in New York, mm -hmm. and you know you can't come to New York without playing the Apollo. That's right. So tell us about his uh, experience there. Yeah, well, his mama took him to, <laughs> to go uh, audition for the uh, amateur night mm -hmm. at the Apollo. And mm -hmm. at that time, Bojangles Robinson was oh, the okay. master of ceremonies. So they auditioned for him, and uh, he did the, uh, the performance for the live audience. Mm -hmm. And uh, as it is today, the audience picks the winner. Mm -hmm. And um, that particular night, the audience didn't pick him. And uh, Bojangles, he says in the film, Bojangles was so upset he came down and was yelling at people. And <laughs> he was saying that uh, uh, the, the man who holds the hand over the head of the participants, mm -hmm. he said he took his hand away too fast <laughs> and all fussing. But he just, uh, he took money out of his own pocket mm -hmm, to give mm -hmm. to my father and his mother because they needed it. It right. was clear that they needed it. Oh, that's great, yeah. that's great. Um, so tell us a little bit about um, some of the famous uh, musicians your father got to see at that time. Because a lot of people didn't have the, op especially people of color, mm -hmm. didn't have the opportunity to see some of these musicians. Right, right, we dug up footage of uh, Joseph Hoffman. He mm -hmm. said he witnessed a concert given by 
Joseph Hoffman, also young uh, Vladimir Horowitz mm -hmm. giving uh, concerts here in New York, um, also Jan Paderewski, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, who played concerts here. Uh, and then Rachmaninoff would perform mm -hmm. from time to time. Mm -hmm. So you really had a, a well-rounded wow. background. That's fascinating. Yeah. So mm -hmm. eventually your father went to Fisk. How did mm -hmm. that come about? Well, when uh, while my father was studying at Juilliard, uh, his teacher, um, Ms. Adler, was in close contact with the then director of the Fisk Jubilee Singers, mm -hmm. uh, Mrs. James A. Myers, mm -hmm. uh, who was in charge in the group of the group in the 1930s. Mm -hmm. And when she told Mrs. Myers uh, about this talented student mm -hmm. that she had, um, she welcomed him with open arms and saw to it that he uh, received some financial assistance mm -hmm, toward mm -hmm. his tuition at Fisk. Wow. So uh, he began his, uh, his undergrad work there in mm -hmm. Nashville and then Uncle Sam called and he uh, went to fight for his country in the Second World War. Um, spent time there in uh, North Africa and uh, south of France, mm -hmm. where he continued to play mm -hmm. in some of the uh, the bistros there, and um, says he became quite a celebrity oh, wow. in the area. <laughs> Uh, learned a little bit of French, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and uh, when he came back uh, to the States because of the GI Bill, mm -hmm. he was able to finish his master's at Juilliard. Oh, okay. And then returned to Nashville to teach. Okay, that's great. Mm -hmm. So when he was in the, um, the armed forces and he traveled to these different countries, did mm -hmm. he discuss the difference in, in, in rela race relations um, there as opposed to how he grew up in the United States? He told some stories in the film uh, about, for example, trying to get a, a haircut in mm -hmm. France. Mm -hmm. uh, the barber clearly not being used to black hair and being so curious, touching it and inviting people to come <laughs> and touch it. He's, he's just trying to get his hair cut. But he, w he was so happy to be able to be treated like a normal person. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, he didn't have to carry the second class status mm -hmm. with him while he was over there. Mm -hmm. And uh, and there again, he didn't really talk to me about what a relief it was to spend time there mm -hmm. because he didn't want me to assume that this negativity would be right. a factor in my life. Mm -hmm. But I remember growing up with this fantasy of just going to Europe and being able to mm -hmm. spend time in France like Josephine Baker wow. and just, you know, going over Anywhere but here was wow. more or less the uh, the attitude. Even though he never explicitly expressed it, mm -hmm. I still got the impression that that's where I have to go. Wow. That's, that's wow. where it's happening. Wow. Yeah. So he came back. Um, tell us how he eventually became the director of the Fist Jubilee Singers. Uh, this was in the late 1950s. Mm -hmm when the director was John W. Work, the mm -hmm. third mm -hmm. famous composer mm -hmm. and arranger of spirituals. Mm -hmm. um, he was directing the group and um, those last couple of tours he really wasn't able to finish because mm -hmm. he was having some uh, physical problems. Mm -hmm. And he asked my father to take over as director. Mm -hmm. Now, meanwhile, my mother had been serving as the piano accompanist for mm, the Jubilee Singers okay. under Dr. Work. Mm -hmm. So when, when my father took over, they uh, continued that relationship as mm -hmm, mm -hmm. director and accompanist. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Good, good. Mm -hmm. Well, I love a good love story. Mm -hmm. So tell us how your father and your mother met as undergrads at Fisk. Okay. They were students together and um, they were really more rivals than anything in oh, the wow. piano department. Mm -hmm, they mm -hmm. would, uh, you know, have these contests of all of the students had to perform mm -hmm, at some mm -hmm. point for the other students and for the faculty. And um, as a woman pianist, she mm -hmm. really didn't, she was the, the star mm -hmm, mm -hmm. for uh, from uh, where she was from. She was from uh, Charleston, West Virginia mm -hmm. and had quite a following there. Mm -hmm. And um, she said, when this young man came in, he just stole her thunder. 
and her heart. <laughs> and well, that, that happened later. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> At first, she was just trying to mm -hmm. to deal with him mm -hmm. taking away her attention. And that, you know, the uh, watching that, I, I didn't really get into my mother's issues so much in this particular film. Maybe that's mm -hmm. for a future project. Mm -hmm. But um, she was having to contend with well-meaning people who just saw them as a couple and would assume that he was the great pianist and she was just the wife. Oh, wow. And they didn't know the history that they they traveled together as duo pianists. Mm. And, you know, when they had a child, you know, this child was going to be a pianist. Mm -hmm. <laughs> as if this child had any choice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But, um, yes, so they, they met at Fisk and then they went elsewhere for graduate studies. And then when they both returned to teach, mm -hmm. that was when they started to look at each other romantically. Oh, that's so sweet. <laughs> um, let's talk a little bit about um, how the Fist Jubilee Singers actually started, because mm -hmm. based on the information I got from the film, uh, when Fist was started, they were made out of wooden structures, and the KKK used to come burn them down. That's so right. they wanted to build a brick structure, and actually Jubilee Singers went out to make money for them. Right, yeah. right. Mm -hmm. And people don't know the, the reason that Nashville is called Music City today is because of the Fisk Jubilee Singers. Wow. They, uh, they were the group, they were the first group of African Americans, former slaves, to travel to Europe after the Civil War. Mm -hmm. And they sang for Queen Victoria. Mm -hmm. And it was her quote. She was the one who said, they sing so beautifully, they must be from the Music City. Wow. And Nashville at that time, we're talking 1872, just six years after the war, mm -hmm. I mean, Nashville was pretty much destroyed. Wow. So here, this group of former slaves was putting Nashville on the world map as a music city right. and not the, for the country music. Right, not right. about the country mm -hmm. music. Mm -hmm. it's, it's amazing how quickly they just claimed mm -hmm. that, mm -hmm. that title for mm -hmm. themselves, mm -hmm. but it was because of the Jubilee Singers. And uh, Queen Victoria also commissioned this life-size portrait that, that many people have seen, wow. but don't realize that this is a group of former slaves, many of them teenagers, mm. you know, who had survived horrors. You, mm -hmm. you just can't imagine mm -hmm. what they were carrying, right. but the the depth of anguish and pain in their histories was what came out in this music. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. audiences all over the world just, just responded financially as mm -hmm. well as mm -hmm. emotionally. Mm -hmm. And this was what built uh, Jubilee Hall in mm -hmm. Nashville at the time, which was the first permanent structure built in the United States for the purpose of educating freed wow. slaves. Wow, that's fascinating. Yes. Wow. So your father also did a solo album. That's right. right. Tell us about that. Yes, it's called Familiar Favorites. Mm -hmm. And uh, this was also after my mother died. Mm -hmm. he, um, he decided to branch out into some gospel mm -hmm. and some jazz. And there's some Duke Ellington arrangements on there. Um, uh, an arrangement of How Great Thou Art, mm -hmm. as well as the classics, some Beethoven and some Chopin. Mm -hmm. And um, he really enjoyed making that album. Oh, wow. And uh, luckily, the album was already released by the time we uh, started putting the film together. Mm -hmm. And we were able to use some of the music uh, from the CD mm -hmm. on the actual film. Mm -hmm. But then by the time we put together all of the the music, the Jubilee Singers performances and their duo piano performances mm -hmm. and radio broadcasts and all of this, we have a 20-track uh, soundtrack CD Wow! that we also put together to make available for the public mm -hmm. because uh, this music was literally uh, rotting away in my father's garage. Wow. The, the reels, the big reels, you know, the actual tape was so old that it was starting to disintegrate. Mm. So we had to uh, to get everything uh, in digital format, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and um, I have it registered in the Library of Congress. Oh, that's awesome! Yes, that's awesome. So with your parents, both your parents being these wonderful musicians, mm -hmm. I know that influenced you to go into music. So tell us about yourself. Ah, well, I also was a child prodigy. Mm -hmm. uh, I gave my first concert at nine years old. Wow. Uh, appeared as piano soloist with the Nashville Symphony when I was 13, doing Gershwin's Rhapsody in Blue. Um, also came to Juilliard for my graduate studies. Mm -hmm. I have a master's in both piano and orchestral conducting. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And um, uh, did the concert circuit while I was a student mm -hmm, here, mm -hmm. uh, playing concerts at many of the HBCUs, mm -hmm. and uh, branching out, going abroad, mm -hmm. doing my thing over there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. 
and um, and coming back to the states, I really came back because of Obama. Mm. I was living in France at the time, and wow. then all of a sudden, my country elected Barack Obama, and I'm thinking, wow, <laughs> my country has changed. Wow. <laughs> it's time to come back. So I came back, and uh, now it's time to go again. <laughs> Can I go with you? No. <laughs> sure, sure, come on, child. We'll have a blast. <laughs> yeah. Tell us about that. You were telling me a story earlier about uh, the New York Times article that they did on you. Um, yes. Yeah. Tell us the circumstances around that. The whole background. Well, mm -hmm. uh, when I finished my master's, um, it was time to compete mm -hmm. to participate in international piano mm -hmm. competitions, and mm -hmm. uh, some of the organizations just. They, they weren't accepting my applications mm. for whatever reason. They needed a photograph. They, you know, so I saw uh, in some cases that they were asking for information on your New York debut. They wanted mm -hmm. to see a review or a program's evidence of a, a debut recital, mm -hmm, which mm -hmm. I didn't have. Mm -hmm. So I went to the John Work Foundation mm -hmm. and asked them to sponsor a mm -hmm. New York debut recital at Lincoln Center, okay. which they did. And um, that New York Times review, I'm mm -hmm. very proud of. Oh, okay. And it is online. If you Google me and uh, New York Times, it'll mm -hmm. come up. Okay, that's great. That's it great. also has my age in there, but I'll see no, if we I don't can get them to wipe that, that out. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, so. Um, if the audience wanted to see your film, mm -hmm. how could they get access to it? The easiest way is to email us directly at Matthew Kennedy Documentary Film at yahoo.com, and it's Matthew with two T's. Um, there's also a Facebook page. Um, you just look up the title of the film, Matthew Kennedy, One Man's Journey, and you can message me there. And um, that would be the easiest way, I think. Okay, okay. And we do, you have um, music CDs also? Yes, yes. Um. We have the uh, Familiar Favorites CD we mentioned, mm -hmm. and also the soundtrack CD for the documentary. Mm -hmm. And this is the actual DVD of the of the film. Oh, that's beautiful. Yes, we're going to put um, all this information on the screen so that you guys can find Nina and get information about her documentary and screen it. We hope you go out and support her, especially tell our young people about this important piece of our history. The Fist Jubilee Singers are the reason that they call Nashville Music City, right? That's right. Exactly. So, until next time, Consider yourself blacklit. Thank you for joining us.